appropriate on this Martin Luther King uh, weekend that we have this type of dialogue. And thank you all for your support on this. And most of all, I'd like to thank Chip Sarfani for all his help this weekend and being all his coordinator. And uh, also, I'd like to thank Ice-T for taking time out of his busy schedule to come down here today. And over the past 10 years, he's been involved in many facets of the entertainment industry. He had roles in the films Breaking, Colors, New Jack City, Ricochet, and his newest release, Trespass, is now currently playing in the theaters. He's also been instrumental in establishing the West Coast rap scene, and tonight you'll have an opportunity to hear his band Body Count perform at Iguanas in Tijuana. And I understand there are a lot of tickets, or a few tickets, still available for that show. And most importantly, over the past year, Ice-T was one of the world's top newsmakers. Um, he predicted the L.A. riots long before they ever happened. He became an issue in the presidential election, and he spoke out vehemently on First Amendment free speech concerns. So here now to introduce Ice-T is the gentleman who deserves most of the thanks for getting him here today, is Mr. Mike Hassan. Thank you very much. Uh, as Art Campbell said, if this started on time, it wouldn't be legit, so we're <laughs> Uh, I do want to uh, thank uh, Joel and Chip. They did a marvelous job in a very short period of time putting this together. And the Entertainment and Sports Law Society is also a great start. Uh, they're a marvelous organization and really typifies, I think, the action that goes on around this place. You know, California Western is now about 70 years old. We've got almost 5,000 alumni in 50 states and 18 countries. We have a rich diversity among the student body and a marvelous tradition as well in bringing in speakers from different points of view. Just in the past few years, we have had ultra-liberal senator from Ohio, Howard Metzenbaum, and the ultra-conservative senator from Wyoming, uh, Alan Simpson. We had uh, Ronald, Ronald Reagan's appointee, the Voice of America, Dick Carlson. We had Jesse Jackson here. Uh, we've also had the former Chief Justice of the California Supreme Court, Rose Berg, and we've had U.S. Supreme Court Chief Justice, William Rehnquist. Our current speaker today fits right within that philosophy. He was raised in Los Angeles, and he spent several years in, in the war, and, in the Army, excuse me, and returned to really begin what has become a meteoric rise in the music industry. He's really a pioneer in the rap field. Uh, I think that he's also received a tremendous number of plaudits uh, for his acting career, uh, all to good reviews. His world tour and his albums have re received extraordinary success. Uh, but there are two themes in addition to the First Amendment which I think deserve mention. One is, if you have followed any of his work, he is very definitely uh, anti-drug, and he's very definitely anti-gang. And he's an articulate spokesman. He's appeared before a congressional subcommittee on the South Central Riots. He's been on the Ted Koppel Show and a number of other programs. And he's here to discuss the First Amendment issue today. We will follow that with a period of questions. And if a law school certainly cannot uh, hear a person speaking on a different point of view, then I don't know who can. So we hope to have a reasonable and open forum today. Let me introduce to you Ice-T. Yeah, uh, I looked up here and I said, that's a courtroom, man. I'm not going to be there anymore. So, uh, first off, uh, I'd like to thank the school for having me. You know, at, at this moment, you know, a lot of people think I'm crazy. So, whenever the schools have us, I would like to thank the school. I think you guys should thank the faculty or whoever got me here because that shows their open mind and willing to listen to something else, you know. And uh, I think that's real. Uh, so let me give them a hand right here. This um, right now, I'm on tour. I'm doing a show tonight in Tijuana, but if I, I got to get a boat to get in there, you know? <laughs> uh, I'm going on a um, college speaking tour right after that, and I speak at different schools. So what I'm going to do is do this the way I usually do. What I do is I start off and I explain to people who I am. Um, I guess a lot of y'all know about me rapping, but it's probably people that don't know who I am and stuff. I've just heard me see pictures of me, you know, Dan Quayle coming down. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I was born in Newark, New Jersey, and I moved to South Central Los Angeles, where I went to Crenshaw High School. I was involved in the gangs there for about four years. 
um, wasn't a hardcore member, but I still got shot twice. Um, I elevated from gang banging to being a street hustler, um, doing all kinds of odd misdemeanor type crimes. Uh, got a girl pregnant when I was in the 10th grade. When she was in the 10th grade, I decided to try to do something, and I went into the Army. I was in the Army, I was an Airborne Ranger. I came out of there after four years, realizing I hated the way the uh, Army was run, because I realized that people were just pawns in the chessboard, and anybody could die, and nobody really cared in the Army, you know, about people. And I really came home trying to be self-employed. I was picked up by my guys who I was involved with crime before I went into the Army, and they were now better criminals, and they had uh, elevated their games to insurance fraud, credit card fraud. We went into armed robberies, jewelry store heist, kidnapping for ransom, uh, big league crime. We're making about $100,000 each a move. Uh, we wanted, one of my boys got busted with 52 aliases. Uh, 17 years, uh, one of my boys was on death row in Lewisburg. Uh, another, four of them were dead. One is doing 20 in Vegas, he escaped and got it back uh, a little while ago. So we were pretty notorious. FBI got files on me. Um, I was very lucky and fortunate never to get stretched by the use of the legal system and knowing how to beat it uh, with fake names and moves. It's just, you can walk through this thing if you slip, you know, but you gotta be careful. And I was very, very lucky. Um, Rap kind of just came to me and saved me. You know, I was rapping in the club. Uh, we had all the money and all the jewelry and all the cars and the girls. We used to party with celebrities. Um, they didn't ask any questions. They said, these are rich kids, you know, we just had it. Uh, and um, I would go into parties and my guys would say, rap, man, rap, because I could just rap. I got to learn how to do it. And rap, you know, and get the girls. We were trying to get the girls. We had all the money, but we couldn't get the girls, so they put me on the stage. And I rapped. And then one day, this, this movie called Breaking walked in, and they at this club in LA called the Radio, and they asked me to to rap in the movie, and I didn't really want to do it. I was like, Nah, I don't want to do that. They said, Well, you make five hundred dollars a day. I'm like, I spend that on sneakers. Man. I don't, I don't want it because I was like. A, a criminal mentally, you know. I mean, I know how to make a lot of money real quick. And uh, my boys told me, said, Ice, man, you need to do this, man. Why do people like you, man? You got a chance. And that's like changed my life because I was like, Why do people like me? And what it really meant was they felt they didn't have a chance to make it legit. They felt they were stuck into this war where this is all they could do. So they pushed me off into this movie. They wouldn't let me go. We were supposed to go to Palm Springs and beat Palm Springs. And they went and they did it and they all got away. And they came back with money and jewelry and everything. But I had went to this audition and got in the movie. And they were like more excited about the movie for me than what they had done. And uh, that was the first page that got in got legit. It was different. It was the first time I ever met a policeman that talked to me like a human being because he had to help me park my car. It was like, you know, over here, so. You know, I didn't understand. <laughs> you know, now people say, well, I see, I understand why you don't like cops because you were a crook, but at the same time, I had a lot of respect for lots of legit cops out there, you know, and even a criminal respects a clean pinch, you know. But they don't respect it when they're riding cops and they're peeling off the top and busting you for this and doing this over here. You know, they're just as big crooks as you, you know. So I was able to deal with lots of crooked cops that would take payoffs and look the other way, and I know exactly how they work. Anyhow, I went through the record business for a while. Like I made my first record deal and got paid $20 for a record, and the guy ripped me off. I was totally not believing I can make it. Then I luckily got a deal in New York City with a label called Sire. Uh, that now has Madonna, a guy named Seymour Stein, Sire. And I did uh, what they call the first gangster rap album. 
And I didn't really think of it as gangster rap. It was just how I was living. I rapped about my lifestyle. I didn't consider myself a gangster. I thought I was more of a player, you know. And um, we made it out the first record to ever get sticker. The first person to ever use the word, I like, call somebody a bitch. It was like really like crazy. When I was on Warner Brothers, and they said, well, do you mind having this record sticker? It's like voluntary. I was like, I don't care. You know, I don't want anybody. I mean, I know this is toxic stuff, but if the kid has to be 18, that's cool. I never, I never saw a problem with somebody knowing what they were going to buy. I thought that was cool. Uh, the records got more and more stickered. Uh, they decided they wanted the, by the second album, they wanted all the lyrics on the album. By the third album, they were really getting deep into it. They pulled me on the Oprah Winfrey show and took me by, tried to go through different lyrics and records. And uh, now I'm on my sixth album, uh, Shit at the Family Body Count, uh, because of the song Cop Killer, which to me was a protest record, which stated that once a cop steps across the line, he's no longer a police, he's just a man, and now we're in the street. Once he over oversteps the boundaries of the law, now I think you're trying to kill me and you're not supposed to do that, so one of us is going to die. It's better you than me. It's a human rights record. It's about the fact that they cannot. I'm not going to bow down to no badge or anybody. I don't understand the theory of you've done wrong. Let me take your life. I don't understand that. I think the only person who can be able to shoot take life is God. So, went through the middle of that. I, I've done a few movies. Um, I got in that movie, New Jack City. I was in the movie Ricochet. I just did a movie called Trespass. A lot of people liked the movie. A lot of people hated it. No, that's cool. And, um, <laughs> I've been charged with uh, sexism. I've been charged with, um, for a while, I used to think I was racist. I don't think, think that anymore. But that's one thing I was charged with. I don't know how. Um, and, um, violent. Unnecessary that I'm a troublemaker if I would just stop talking, all the problems would go away. And last but not least, now the new one is I'm paid, so therefore I'm no longer part of the ghetto and I shouldn't be able to talk about it. So now they're telling me, make me feel guilty for being successful. And the bottom line is, anything I have is just a millimeter. I mean, it's, it's just so, such a small percentage of what they've taken from me as far as in this music business or in this show business. I mean, I was in the movie New Jack City. I got paid $20,000. The movie made $67 million, you know? So when people get mad at me, like, oh, Ice-T, you bought a Rolls Royce. I mean, still, somebody else bought a house and a boat and a plane with what I did. <laughs> Only, all I'm getting is maybe what's just due to me. And it's funny because when you do get a little something, people turn around and say, oh, God, you're not us anymore. And that's ridiculous. You know, I think we should be happy if you see somebody come up, you know. So um, that's who I am, basically. Now, as far as what I also hear to talk about is uh, my agenda as far as me being an artist. My agenda is, is trying to get the people who I feel is like, they're like, I think there's a whole other nation of people in America that want the right thing to happen, that are filled with racism, that are ready to give everybody an evil break and make it. And I'm trying to make them rise up. I'm looking at a revolution. I think every 100 years you have a revolution. This time I think we're going to go through what I call an intellectual revolution. The people, last generation, turned into yuppies. Uh, they were started off wanting something, they fell into the system, and then they became part of the conservative system, and they just got sucked in. You got, what I'm hoping you got to do, to become a radical breed of urban professionals. It's like, because you have conservatives, that's people who like it the way it were. I, there's no way you can be black and like it the way it was. See, we only have we only have the future and the hope. Liberals are people who are like, okay. Then you say, well, let's march. I don't know. It's raining. You know, it's like. 
They're liberal, but they're also very lackadaisical. They don't really want to make a move. There's only one thing left, it's radical. We have to be radical. We have to make change. Um, that's why you see the music sound the way it does. Back in the 60s, they had music. Yeah, to protest music. That was because we had the independent movement of um, Vietnam. Now I think people feel the independent movement of the system just closing in on us and killing us. If we don't start treating people as human beings. Um, I uh, really hope for that. I, I, I'm totally against racism. I mean, I look at everybody as being very misinformed and just a lot of lies and with hip hop. And you gotta remember with rap, there's a lot of bad rap. There's a lot of good rap. It's not all good, it's not all good country music, it's not all good rock, you know. It's, one of these people that don't speak on a microphone. And I don't know if I know what I'm talking about, but it's an opinion. At least you get an opinion. When you listen to a nice tea album, which you wish you hear me step up on a bench in the middle of the park and say, it's on my mind, you know. You disagree with me and you agree with me. But you can't all think the same way, you know. They say, we all think the same way, only one of us is thinking. So you got to come back with it. And I want to see unity and people work together, but I think the only answer is, is information being exchanged. And with hip hop, you've seen a real research, a real like attack of education. And, and that's the problem because you have white kids going home to their parents saying, Mama, we didn't build no pyramid. And Elizabeth Taylor was not Cleopatra. And Mexico would have been a rich country if it wasn't for the Alamo. And what makes the Japanese and Oriental people the enemy? And what makes John Wayne such a because we kill him. So, and this is all coming from rap. This is not coming from the school book. See, we're here and we're saying, wait a minute, it's a lot of mis you know, people are being taught the wrong thing. The problem with schools in America right now is the books are one sided and, and it's very bad for a kid to go to a uh, public school it, when he doesn't get what that, that the brothers call knowledge of self. Okay, let's take me and any guy, any white guy. I graduated from high school. What did I learn? I learned I was a slave. I learned Indians were savages. I don't know what a Jamaican is. I don't know what, uh, I think Italian people are mafia. I think that, uh, I think, because you don't learn nothing about anybody, all right? You don't, you learn the Orient to the enemy. You learn the Mexicans are poor. This is what you learn in, in school. And then the white kid learned that he did everything. And the matter of fact, He's God because Jesus Christ is God's son and, and he's white thanks to Michelangelo's brother, who that position is. Uh, so it's like So what happens is I walk out of school feeling like I'm not anybody. And he comes out of school feeling like he or she is somebody and it hurts each of us. And it hurts everybody. So what I need, what they need to do is change my opinion, change school curriculum from history, or at least add a class that's mandatory, which is called humanity, where you teach everybody the great things about each race and religion. You know, and everybody to show people why the Orientals are a very powerful dynasty and you deserve respect. And show people that Africa is the biggest continent, you know, so we can and, 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 and what's really coming out of South Africa so people can have confidence in themselves. Because without confidence, nobody is going to succeed. Everybody feels like the other man is better than me. And everybody has a reason to be proud of who they are. But until that happens, and America doesn't teach that. You know? I mean, if it's a melted top pot, then let it melt, you know? But it's, I, I mean, it's just really found the way things are set up. So in my music, I try to touch on that without getting heavy. I still do one thing that people don't understand with rap. It's called talking shit. Now, <laughs> rap, we do the thing called talking shit. And Public Enemy always says something at the end of their rap. They say, it's a black thing and you've got to understand. 
black people have the ability to talk shit in a way that nobody really understands unless you're black. Black people, a black man will sit out and say, I will wrap my dick around this courtroom five times and fuck your mom. <laughs> it does not mean that. It just means that. It means he's talking shit. We do this. If you hang around black guys long enough, they will start talking about each other's mother, their girlfriend, their lips, their hair. This is how we are. Now, I don't know how white people do it because I'm not white. I haven't been around enough, but I know it scares the shit out of some people <laughs> when they hear it. We talk about fucking people up all the time. I'll fuck you up. I'll kill you. We don't really mean it. We just talk shit. I think this is one of the reasons why we've been wrapped and attacked with such misunderstanding. It's like, you gotta remember, when you're listening to a rap record, it's like you're picking up a phone conversation. Good, hardcore rap. And it's the guy talking about his girl. You mean that bitch, man? Yeah, she, she wasn't there. She wasn't doing it. And this is how they talk on the phone. This is how I talk. You dig? So what happens is, America's middle class of the Tipping Wars and all these other people pick up the <laughs> pick up the line, they hear us talking shit and say they shouldn't talk like that on the phone. Now what, what a rap record is, is we allow you to listen in on the, on the conversation. When the girls are talking shit, oh his dick was, he, he, he. People, don't to, people don't want to admit that that's how people talk. Maybe it's not how everybody talks. but. If you pick up the wrong phone, you're going to hear a wild conversation. <laughs> Rap is wild conversation, okay? At times, it's attacking people. One thing about good rap, or hardcore rap, it needs, I don't know the words right, it needs an enemy to go after. Because with hardcore rap, you're mad, you're not happy. You, got, you, got, you have pop rap, who say about homework, school, very popular. A lot of groups do that. You know, Fresh Prince and Two Kitty Play. That's, that's cool. You know, Hammer, Prey. You know, that's cool. But that pop music is a blatant attempt to be popular. You gotta be popular. Hardcore is, I'm gonna say this on my mind, who cares? Okay. With hardcore music, you're gonna hear a, you need somebody attack. So you're gonna attack the system. You're going to attack the cops. You might attack women. Now, a lot of men in rap attack women, and there's a good answer for it, because most of the guys weren't getting no girls before they started making records. <laughs> women, women in America are extremely materialistic, and they have a habit of treating you different if you got a little money. And the guys get very angry about it, and they talk shit. A lot of guys talk mess about girls, because they just ain't got no girl. And they just, they just mad about it. <laughs> My old comment to that is, this guy, that's how he's talking. He's got a problem. Don't buy his record. Uh, people say he's perpetuating this and all that. There's some girl albums out there. I don't know if I can know fish problems. Uh, there's some girls out there that say some stuff on these records that scared me to death, right? My girl was listening to one of these records and this girl was talking about how to get your man and he came in late and I'm like, take that out, I need some parental guidance. I was like, what are you doing? But my comment to that is too shit. You dig? It's like, it's gonna happen. People say, oh, why are you talking about bitches? Bitches, bitches, bitches. I believe that I talk about problems. What I speak on is problems. And bitches are problems. <laughs> Whether they be male or female, bitches. <laughs> One of my records on the OG album was some of you niggas is bitches too. Which means, a bitch to me is somebody who thinks the world revolves around them and they have to have everything their way. And their women get treated as women. But I mean, people say, well, why don't you make a record about how happy you are about the women? I don't know, I, I just make, I make records about bitches because they make me mad. This is something to talk about. I don't know. But, 
If you ain't on this, then the record's not directed at you. You get what I'm saying? And everybody in this room knows somebody who's a bitch. <laughs> so, so don't take it personally if it's not directed at you. So, that, I mean, sexism. I think I'm about as sexist as any man. I um, don't believe in anybody. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm never going to be talking about beating up no woman. Rape no woman. One one time I wrote a record about a guy, a guy who did a girl with a flashlight. And I went, oh, no. But there was no word he, he raped a girl with a flashlight. What happened was we had seen it in a book. There was a book, and I seen a girl with a flashlight, uh, all kinds of kitchen utensils. <laughs> and I was like, oh shit. So I wrote a <laughs> I wrote a rap and she was doing it to herself. You know, it ain't nothing I'm making up. This is just stuff I see. I'm like, oh shit. So, and now another thing that record was talking shit. Because if you also believe he did the girl the flashlight, then you also believe the titties blinked up, lit up like taillights. <laughs> and next verse, Charlie Dam did a girl on a ski lift and John O'Dee broke car glass with his dick. I mean, this is just crazy. <laughs> you know? So, I think all those people that aren't understanding what they're listening to. I've never got a, record, a, a letter from a fan that misunderstood a record. If any, the only letter I ever got negatively from a fan, somebody said, I, I love you up to now, was when I played a cop in New Jack City. People said, I, we didn't think you were down with the man. Why did you play the police? And I said, that's, I, my reply was, I was acting. <coughs> and my job was to act as a policeman. It doesn't mean I love him. You know, but I've never had somebody say, I love you up to now. You've done something I don't understand. Uh, rap is an acquired taste. You might not like how I taste, you might like how, like how another one does, but that's what I do. And I don't understand any other format but hardcore. So right now, I guess we can, you can ask questions. I, I have um, anything about the cop killer thing, about the Constitution, because one thing I'll end on this, as far as free speech goes, I do not believe that the First Amendment exists. I believe it is a concept. I believe the entire Constitution is a concept. It reads well, sounds great, <laughs> but there's loopholes in that thing you can walk through, man, you can drive my tour bus through this. <laughs> it doesn't work. There is no free speech. You can't say whatever you want on TV. You can't say whatever you want in a major publication. You can't speak on the radio. You might not be able to say what you want at the school. I don't know. But the minute you get to the mainstream, there is censors. They have a guy in the newspaper called an editor who is the censor. They have censor boards. MTV comes on, stop censorship. But they censor every video you put on there. They go through it. I mean, we've sent videos there five times to get accepted. So everybody believes that there's a First Amendment. Now, you guys being lawyers, you guys work with the Constitution. That's your main tool. Now, me telling you that it doesn't exist is a real strange thing. But I think deep down inside, you know that it is there to be manipulated, twisted to your benefit as a good lawyer. So, but if it's not one way, then it's not there, really. You understand what I'm saying? So, I mean, even with the, with the one, with, um, which amendment is about God? I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> What's that? Which one amendment is there? Second amendment? Huh? Okay. It said we have the right to bear arms. So they take away assault rifles. But if you really read into the amendment, it says this, that is because it's your last form of defense against tyranny, right? So why do you need a hunting rifle for a war? That, that's what you have the right to bear arms for, the minute the police become the enemy. You need a MAC-10. You need a <laughs> That's why you have the right to bear the gun. So when they turn around and say, you don't need the gun because it's not for hunting, that's not why you have the right. You have the right in case of a war to protect yourself. So it's bullshit, you know, it's just it's read the way they want to read it. So let's move on and start attacking it. <laughs> right to mention. My question is, uh, do you feel like the bottom kind of space as far as you know to have a lot of white influence, you credit, have an office, and the land Do you feel that if I 
by shifting from more of a punk hardcore sort of sound that you're more legitimized by the white community? Or, I mean, what's the deal with like this? Do you like punk? Yeah, well, I've been in the rock for a long time. I grew up listening to like Black Sabbath and the voice of Cult. And, and then I moved into Black Flag, Circle Jerk, Echo. I listened to Mind of the Threat, No Means No, uh, Lar. I got, I didn't know that you had to be white to like rock. <laughs> I didn't know that. I didn't, I didn't say you like what you like. Um, rock and roll is black music. It was invented by black people. Uh, it started out Little Richard and the sister, and the white kids enjoyed it, and the sister said, oh, can't have that, can't have a black icon, let's take a Pat Boone and have him remake all of Little Richard's records. <laughs> yeah. And we musically segregate these kids. Um, rock, to me, is an attitude. If, if you sing along the top of the system and say, like I say, go to school, have sex in a missionary position after you marry, all that, <laughs> you're being popular and you're doing popular. But anytime you take the system and you rock it, you're doing rock and roll. Whether it's done like a, with a piano, like Little Richard, or with loud guitars. So in my, from my perspective, I should be able to rock harder than anybody because I have a lot to say. And whether I do it with beats or guitars. See, to me, my rap music is rock. Mine is the music, records. But I just wanted to do it. I had a bunch of friends who were good musicians. They were always begging me, man, let me play more on this album. I was like, nah, nah, why don't we make a group? We made it. We titled it Body Count because every weekend the news would come on and say 15 people killed in gang homicides, now sports. <laughs> That's all I am. It's a body count, a statistic. We named it that, and uh, we performed with DRI. And up to now, we perform with every major. I mean, we now we, 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 we've done some roles Metallica, Sepultura, Ministry, all the hardcore bands. People like it because it's an attitude. It's not a white thing. So that's what we're doing. Yeah. Well, I usually like to do these type of forms all together because they get better. In other words, like I like doing speaking tours because I can take something from what I learned from you guys because I'll learn from your questions and I'll ask them to the other people, you know, if they don't answer. But I get better. Like when I have to do a show and then do one of these, it's hard, you know. I'm, like right now I'm thinking about sound check and I'm talking to you. So it, I try to organize things. You know, what I'm saying is, it's like when MC Hammer gets dressed, he's showing himself to the public so he can make a certain amount of money about how it looks. So do you think about how to present yourself as a kind of money turning in? I'm at a point where I really have no control over that because I, I just don't give a fuck anymore. I'm like, this. I'm, I'm comfortable with myself, and I know that I can only be me, you know. So I just break a lot of rules. I mean, like I wear jewelry, rock and roll guys don't wear jewelry, you know. I wear jewelry because I mean, they, a lot of those guys had money and they want to. It's cool for them to wear torn jeans. To me, wearing torn jeans is an insult to people who have to wear torn jeans. I, I'm not going to wear tear my jeans. I got money to wear nice pants, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I want things, so I'm on a different thing. I've never had anything, so I'm trying to achieve, but not in dress particularly flashy for you guys. <laughs> I love uh, right? The question I have is, concerning the comments you just made, don't you feel it would be more important to take the cop killer thing all the way through the court system to kind of change things, rather than just let it go? Okay, cop killer incident got out of control. The record, we never thought that record was so toxic. We thought Mama's gonna die tonight, it's gonna be the record people would 
trip on this matricide, this guy killing his parents over racism. And uh, the cops jumped on him. I believe that the cops got more mileage out of me than anything. The reason I think they attacked the record was it was a way of reversing the polarity on the issue. At that moment, the cops were under a barrage of attacks and brutality, which they were extremely guilty of. So the best defense is an offense. You got the lawyers, you know it. The way you get out of trouble is you attack. When you got home late, the girl asked you, where you been? You jump on her. Where were you? You get mad at her. And she forgets about she. So what they did was, this is, this is everybody was getting them for what they did. They turned around and said, look at Ice T. Here's a record that Warner Brothers dropped during the riots live. It was dropped four months before the riots. And how tacky could they be, right? America, ignorant, you know, majority says, oh, white tea is so terrible. The headlines filled up with me. No longer did you see any issues of brutality in the press. And they used me like really important. They, they covered up the real issues. Then the politicians said, oh, this is a good folk, and we can jump on this and figure out who's on which side of this. And now all of a sudden, they're jumping on this cop killer thing, a record that's old, OK? Um, they really worked this. They pulled close to $150 million out of Warner Brothers. That's a lot of money. I'll never make that money for Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers was in a catch-22 because being an entertainment or an information company, they could not allow anybody to tell them what they could or could not say. See? So they couldn't move. It was like a stalemate. They were, and the cops were picking in. One problem was the people didn't step up behind this record. The people just were like, whatever. Nobody cared. There were 250 cops out there. There was like 30 people back in the record, all right? Because people don't care. None of the record companies came, you see, because they were happy to see Warner Brothers in trouble. These are business people, right? They don't care. The First Amendment was the farthest thing from my mind. You understand? I did. I don't care about the First Amendment because I know there is no free speech. I didn't want people to say he has the right to say whatever he wants. That really means nothing. It means I don't agree with him, but I needed people to back me on the issue. I see has the right to be mad at these cops because they're killing his brothers and sisters in the street. He has the right to make this record. But the free speech, he has a right to. That was the issue. People had to understand that the cops are out there killing people, all right? Oh, well, he has the right to say what he wants, you know? I don't agree. So everybody played passive like they all love police, and some of y'all might. I don't, okay? Not the cops are out there brutalizing people, okay? And there's never been a black leader that I have to look up to that liked the cops. I challenge you to name one, okay? So my role model is myself in this situation, and I'm like, Fuck the police, you know what I'm saying? But Warner Brothers was going down. They had problems. They weren't signing anybody. They had created a, 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 an embargo on them. So I sat up and I said, it ain't Warner Brothers battle. I said it. Warner Brothers is taking the heat from me. That's just like right now, if I went to this school and they were going to try to close the school down. If I'm a real soldier, I can step away from the school and say, it's not the school, it's me, right? The First Amendment. So I said, yo, cops, it's me. It's not one of us, okay? I'll pull the record, right? I'm going to give the record away. I'm going to continue to talk how I feel. And then it's over, because they cannot attack me. There's nothing they can do to me besides kill me. And I'm not afraid to die, see? Because the price of freedom is death. And if you're not ready, then don't get in this. You get where I'm coming from. I'm about trying to change things, you know, really. Warner Brothers. They've been cool with me and I owe them one. And that's what I did. Because I did it so you could sell more records. Shit, I could have dropped that record, pulled it off, and they still would have dropped me. Because I'm a troublemaker. My next record is going to be as radical and crazy. You know, I don't know what they're going to do. But in this situation, they were attacking Warner Brothers and not me. They had threatened Lenny Warnerker's children, which I know. There's a lot of people, secretaries, people that work up here. They sent two bombs, real bombs, to the label. This is real. This is real. They had 
agents go to my kid's school and interrogate my daughter and ask her, do you feel, how do you feel about your father making records about police? She told me, fuck, she like, get out of here. <laughs> but the headlines would have been, Ice T's daughter does not agree with the music he makes, which would have discredited me. See, they I, the IRS, they audited me. They tried to stop one of my loans. Because you guys know that once the government finds you as a subversive or radical, they can start files on you. They follow me to shows and they tap my phone. But I'm not going to do anything against the law at this point. I'm square as a pool table twice as green at this point. I'm waiting, <laughs> I'm waiting for them to do something to me so I can come here and all of us can sue them together. <laughs> That's why people bought this record. And we got more records than that one record. That's this one record I've made 90 songs, you know? So it was time to push that to the side. That's why I still performing the song. Yeah, I'm still performing the song because it's my record and I, and I believe that song. That song is real. But Warner Brothers no longer is selling it, so they got to leave Warner alone. You see what I'm saying? But they got to do whatever they got to do to me. They boycott my shows and all that. I'm ready for that. You know, that right up there. You were, uh, Now definitely, it's like the, the more success I gain, the more angry I get. It's like the farther I move to the ghetto, the farther I realize. It's like the farther I go up, it's the farther I know that my friends are down. It's not like I'm really gaining, I'm just really getting to where people should be. And I'm really realizing how deep a hole my, my people are. And I'm true to the gang. Like I said, I was a gang member. A lot of my friends were in prison. And every day, like we just came off tour and one of my boys got killed. Last year, I lost five friends. My friends haven't had the luxury to die in old age. And um, that was real. So there's no way I could ever really lose that. Plus, my friends would kick my ass. It's like... <laughs> Like I got, I grew up in the kind of neighborhood that no matter how much money I got, they still come see me, you know. So I'm every time I do an interview, I get letters from folks and pensions. I read that out of here, yeah, you said the right thing. You keep saying that, boy. You know, so I'm just saying that all the time. They know what I'm doing. I have no option for that. Would you talk to them about saying I pick myself up? Yeah, I got friends that still drug dealers and everything else, you know. And um, they know I ain't with it. But then at the same time, if I'm not going to say, come live with me, I really can't pass judgment because I was down there too. So they know I don't appreciate it. But when they talk to me, they say, yo, I just, you know, I'm trying to do this, I'm trying to do that. And they know I got love for them regardless because I was there. You see what I'm saying? I've been so dirty, you just can't imagine that. I cannot pass judgment on anybody. I don't care what you do for a living. So I try to understand that. The FBI has made a statement. They said, regardless to what type of, of uh, organization IC runs, he's surrounded with convicted felons. Everybody that works for me is a convicted felon, okay? So there is land for my people. And at times, one of my guys might go out and do something wrong, and everybody's like, hush, hush, don't tell ICE, don't tell ICE, you know? But my friends know that the police are after me, they keep their stuff away from me. But because you do something wrong, I'm not at the point where I turn my back on you. I just let you know I don't agree with that, you know? You have to do something really wrong that I really don't dig. It just gets spread out. You leave the knife of love my home. Uh, I'm interested, you talked about an intellectual revolution, and I'm interested uh, particularly how you think lawyers and you know, young white lawyers like us can help. I mean, what, what part can you play? Have lawyers helped you at all? You, you know, what's your experience with your friends? Well, you know, lawyers are. <laughs> Lawyer, 
a lawyer, that's the best game in the business. <laughs> It's like, when you, if you're a criminal, when you're making money, your lawyer's there, and they never tell you don't do it. <laughs> I always had these good lawyers, like the lawyer with Pinky Ray, and they always like, hey, come on, man, you just gotta tighten it up, tighten it up. Because what they really know is that when you go under, they're gonna have everything you got. <laughs> you walk in there, you're like, oh man, they caught us out there, for such and such, you said, don't worry about it, I'm gonna flip this, I know the DA. Bam, you're gonna be out of, oh, nice Rolex, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because they know you're gonna come back with it. You're gonna call them from a hole and say, give me that Rolex, thank you. And they're gonna sit there, their kids, you know, <clears throat> pond springs on it, spring break. <laughs> so, I mean, as far, as far as you guys being the law and looking out for people, I just, I mean, I, See, I don't really under, I don't really know how to to, to, to to guide lawyers. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, if anything, I think uh, you guys know better than anybody. This is what you do, and you you you'll, you'll learn so quick on the sides of the game. It's like don't want to turn into politicians. <laughs> Not that. Did you did you and your friends were talking about constitutional rights before? Did you know? Do people know that they have the right not to be searched? Oh, okay, and that's that. Cops. No, you can't look at my car. No, you can't. See, you know that stuff? the thing about that kind of law is there's not money in that kind of law. You see what I'm saying? It's important. And if you want to be that type of lawyer to go out and look, if anybody wanted to really get in and, and, and start out, I don't know what you guys do, start out interns and friends, I don't know what it is. But going in as far as working in the areas where there's lots of crime and stuff and helping kids and people just knowing their rights. Because, yeah, you don't know your rights. I mean, I just learned my rights, you know, recently. You know, I, I learned that I don't have to lay down in the street. I learned all these different things about how the police can be. I learned I can call the cop pig. You know, <laughs> that I don't have to, that, 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 that's not against the law to refer to them as pig, you know. So, yeah, but, but see, one thing about the, the, the law is the cop, once they know that you know, it treats you differently, you see. So their objective is to take you to the limit of what they can, like your ignorance, as soon as you say, no, I'm not gone. Oh, okay, cool. I mean, when we, were, <laughs> when we were criminals, we used to always say that our parents were attorneys. That was like one of our caps. Like when I used to steal jury, I used to walk in and say, oh, yes, my father, you know, he's opening up a law firm out here, you know. He, uh, he's a white guy, he's big up. And they'd be like, oh, all right, my father's a state trooper based down. I give us some lies and shit. But lawyers are cool. My, but my lawyer got rolled up the other night. I'm going to one of my concerts. I know how to feel now. A little beer. And they they dog him out because he's a little Jewish guy. I know beer. No, but what I, what I, what I just hope as far as the agenda at everybody, whatever job they take, is that they realize that everybody has to get, we have to even, either start treating everybody as people or the system eventually is going to eat itself. It's like the, the poverty that's created in my neighborhood, the attitude where, so what, is what eventually is going to come back and get you. You know, you have to make sure so everybody can, can, can survive this you know, one way. Side games. Going back to what you said a little bit earlier about the Second Amendment. Um, you said that we need the Second Amendment and the right to keep our guns. No, I didn't say we needed it. I just said what it really stands for. Okay, and if I remember correctly, um, um, you said that, that we need it because uh, we need to be able to have guns uh, in case it's war. Right. right. No, in case it's tyranny, in case it's assault, in case it's a revolution. <laughs> well, my question is that since the second amendment was written back you know, 200 years ago, uh, when there was a possibility of a so you really had to be here when you were in the country. That rule doesn't exist in the long term. Oh, you weren't in South Central? <laughs> That possibility will no longer exist. 
My question is, is would you agree that to get the guns in the streets, get rid of the Uzis in the streets, do you think that that would open the door for a lot of getting rid of all the fear and misunderstanding between the people in the streets? What if you start getting a little bit? Now, the only way I would say get rid of the guns is the, the cops get rid of the guns. Because, see, my, my big experience with police is this. So, as long as they got guns, I need guns. That's the confrontation I'm afraid of. Is the day they say they're gonna kill me or us or my neighborhood or this particular project is shut down and they're gonna go in and murder people. And they've done it. You know? Also, no, I don't think that'd be the answer. Get rid of the cops, like in Britain where the cops don't carry guns, that's a whole other thing. But as long as they're highly armed, we need to be highly armed. Because we don't who's to say that they are right, man? I mean, what at any point they could, you know, it's like when crime escalates, law escalates. And when the cops can't handle it, they take on martial law, which means they bring in the National Guard. When the National Guard is their ass kicked, they bring in the Marines. They will send a Cobra into a housing project. They're ready to do that. And they will pull a gun on America and say, don't move. Nobody move. They're not going to allow a violent takeover. Understand? So, but do you want to be unarmed? You did? It's like the idea of it got to be a hunting rifle to me doesn't make any sense. You know, um, once again, the Constitution, when you talk about back in the day when it was written, if that's the case, it doesn't pertain to black people at all because we were considered property when it was written. So the theory of me speaking now is like if dogs just start speaking tomorrow, now, seriously, and every other word came out of your mouth was fuck shit, whatever. You would say, well, we didn't mean it because we didn't know dogs would ever talk. So, black people talking was not in the Constitution because we were not people. See, so therefore it doesn't even count for anybody of color, being Asian, Indian, black, anything. It just means for white people. What do you think about uh, what uh, Jim Brown did? Rebuilding gangsters and getting back in the neighborhood and like Peter Gibraltar's program trying to rebuild uh South Central. How what you're doing, what's the community doing? How things going? Anything. Oh hell, I just did a new video for my new song. It's called Got a Lot of Love. And I'm donating all the money from my single to uh, Hands Across Wives. They got thirty thousand gang members over there that have gone to a truce. I think the press and media are not even hyping this. It's like it's nothing. The gang troops should be national news, you know. More of my friends have died in the gang wars than in any overseas wars, Vietnam, Persia, I don't know. I'm talking about, I mean, at least 15 of my close friends, and I mean, anybody black has been touched by the gang wars. They're killing 16, one weekend they killed 18 kids. It's real, it's, it's, it's about a gunfire going on down there. Now there's the troops, and he's totally like, stop. Why aren't they hyping it up? Now, cops, I, I've been to the meetings. The cops come, they stand around, they shake kids down for like weed and stuff like that. Just harass them, really, because they're not going anywhere. They're not going to fight, right? But the cops are telling white people that if the gangs get together, they're coming to get them to create an attitude of, we don't want the gang troops to have it. We're going to have them kill themselves. The kids over there, the gang troops, ain't talking about you know, white people. They're talking about the police. They're telling the cops that we're not going to bow the police whooping on us anymore. They're saying that over there, that every cop that steps out of line is going to die. They're really serious about it. So they're like, at a, see, the problem is this, man. With the system, the system has, has a check and balance system. When, when, when you do wrong, it's a consequence. You say, you speak, take, steal, jail, consequence. Where do the people issue consequence on the system? How do we? When they do us wrong, what can we do? When Bush pardons people and we don't agree, what do we do? There's no consequence. So therefore, they're uncheckable and they do whatever they want. The riots in LA was a consequence. Even though it hurt the people of the same neighborhood, it let people s s see that people are going to react. Until people react, you're going to go crazy. A baby will continually reach up on the table to issue a consequence. 
that's how we stand in one. We have to start issuing the consequences. Yeah, I, I listen to what you said about Hawthorne. Well, the main criticism is that the record might cause somebody to the edge to go out and do it. But that's not been proven and nobody's done it and the record been out of here. So, I mean, if four people have done it, it still wouldn't prove that the record is, you understand what I'm saying? It's like, I think that's invalid. Uh, then people say, well, how can records be positive and work and negative? And not hurt. I, I think that's because it's human nature to do good over evil. I think it's harder to make somebody be wrong than it is to make somebody be good. Um, the fact that the cops are afraid, I'm very happy. You know, for me to give them one sleepless night after the history they've given me, my people, it's the greatest thing I can do in the world. To see them mark big at me in the middle of the winter. I mean, we were out in the middle of, in, of, of Colorado, and they're marching around out there, and we were inside. I mean, we made a joke when he saw 100 cops outside ice to in the winter. Cops are. <laughs> <laughs> I think they need to understand that the record was a check. It was a check that was saying, do not continue this brutality. You can die, too. Just because you got that badge on, don't mean you won't get killed. And everybody needs that, you know. Even with you and your woman, you know. You got to know she'll kill you, man. <laughs> you know, everybody got to know that. And that's all it is. It's like a check that we're not going to bow any longer. And they need to feel a little uncomfortable. Yeah. I keep saying uh, you recognize that there's a platform, but uh, think about it. Talk about hardcore music being a point of view. Do you dismiss, say, other artists like I'm from the top one million and their ways of views as another point of view also? Yeah, because I, I mean, I know Axel Rose, and you know, he used the word nigga in a record. So did Perry Farrell, who's one of my best friends. And ain't like I ain't never said white boy cracker or something like that. <laughs> you know, so that doesn't mean you're a racist. I can meet you, I can know you, and understand you. You know, I, I went out with Axel Rose on tour. And uh, he said, Ice Man, I'm a victim of this, this, this press, and this media game. He said, how many people do you think actually know me? Really know me, you know, hang out with me. He said, everybody else just walked and talked to me for three minutes and made a decision on me, the same way people do to you. He said, that's why I want you out here on this tour, man, because we're both being attacked and the same thing. No, I mean, it takes more than a word to be a racist. You understand what I'm saying? A racist is a mental thought, a mental thing. You can make a statement, I can say something, you can call somebody out a nigga. You know what I'm saying? I call white people a nigga, you know what I'm saying? So it it just and also in his record, he said, yo, that was me 18 years old getting off the bus. It might not be actual today. You see what I'm saying? But um, nah, I don't need records that deep. Come out and do something, let me know, fire some people, say it. I think a good racist will let it be known. You know? <laughs> I don't like it, straight up. If he's young, you know, then he makes a move on like that. <laughs> you mentioned uh, that you had a real sense of pride when you made the first uh, Honest Mike on the first film. How do you think you get the gang kids to understand the difference between making an honest movie versus becoming one of the makeup of the See, that's hard, man. It's real hard. Um, if I didn't have my friends to really push me, I wouldn't have made it. I did. I didn't want to even make honest money. And the money I made wasn't a lot. I had to move from like uh, $2,000 a month, like laid out crib. We were living in a hustle, player house, man. We had it popping. It was going on to uh, what I was paying. $200 a month, parking up under a house. I had like a little bit of you know. I was in there, I woke, I was eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, and I had pawned all my jewelry. This is when I was trying to be a rapper. And I was like, man, and I know I could walk out and hit a lick. I was just that good, you know. And um, 
My boys would come in, stole the flashy cars, and give me money. I'd stay down. See, what they knew was, they said, Ice can get out, man. One of us can get out. Maybe he'll be in one day of the And I am. They would have hired him. But they thought it was only one of us who can make it. Kind of like sad, you know. <coughs> to the average kid, what I try to tell them is, I try to instill hope in them and, and the belief that there's a chance. That's the whole problem. You have to feel you have a chance uh, to make it. I try to deter people from show business. Because even if you look at Los Angeles or all of California, there's four rappers. I mean, you got Ice Cube, myself, Too Short, and Hammer. Uh, up at top, yes, sir, makes a lot of sad. They don't rap. I mean, Tone Loke was here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's no high. So, how, the odds on being me is not going to happen. So, I try to explain to them, get into the business, show business if you want to be in Get into this. I, and I, you don't know how many kids I tell try to be lawyers. You know? <laughs> My lawyer broke it down to me. He said, well, being a lawyer is basically memorizing books. You know, he's like, you know the books, you know the law, and you've got a good presentation, and you're a good liar. And you're good liar. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you know, but it's hard, and that's one of the hardest things I have to do every day. I go to, I don't only go to colleges, I go to juvenile halls, I go to schools, I go to penitentiaries. Imagine that, talking to guys who are in the life. The issue yeah. of pride means a lot, so you can, um, you can help instill all of them if they feel good about themselves. I think pride is everything. And as long as you, if you don't feel good about yourself, you're going to start tearing your body up, you're going to get on drugs, you're going to feel like you're not worth anything. I used to feel like jail was no different than home. And jail was not worth it. It was more friends in there, you got up every day. It was different, you become institutionalized. There's a lot of people in the joint like that. I had to feel that there was something better out here. If one thing out here is not a jail, that's miracles. So, and that's real. That's really what they take away from you in jail is your freedom and your ability to make contact with the opposite sex. It's, it's really strange, but if they started a jail where every day they sent a different plate with money into yourself, there would be a line to get into jail. Everybody would be trying to get locked up. So, that's what they would take away from you more than anything. It's just your contact with other human beings of women. You know, or there's a lot of policemen now that are black in the military system and they even co often in the new LA police chief is black also is trying to make some positive changes, not only for minorities but for women. How do you feel about when dealing with black police officers, black prison guards, black security officers? Um, well the black policemen's organization did not join in on the boycott of cop killing. They made a statement. And all the boycotts we've seen in all the march, and I ain't never seen a black cop. Um, I think by being black, maybe you have a chance to understand this thing a little bit better. But just because you're black, don't mean you're black. You know, you can be white, black. See, I have a, my attitude is like, if, if you agree with how everything is going, and the world's work totally perfect, or you happy, you like to reinforce <laughs> You're in the white, you're in the you're loving it, let's keep it like this. And if you see a problem, you're in the black. Now it has nothing to do with color, skin color. You know, uh, a lot of white people march to the civil rights march and got hanged right alongside of black people. You know, so it's from here where you're coming from. And a lot of black skin people have no love for black people. They avoid their plight. They, they can get to a position like me and they made a whole bunch of new friends and they, they just don't, they, say, oh, they, they just cast away who they are. I ain't got no love for them and I ain't them more than anybody else. Now, um, he used to call them back today, they used to call them housemates. Um, I uh, deal with all cops the same, man. I've had white cops walk up to me, get autographs with a five year old daughter, you know, you know who I am, you know, and just. And I've had more cops, you'd be surprised, since cop killing, I've had more cops come up and get body count autographs. You just don't know. They do it on the sneak. <laughs> man, yeah, man, there's some cops in my unit I want to kill. <laughs> I 
Because the song is, is aimed at that particular officer. I got a friend, a sheriff, he flies the helicopter in LA. And um, he said the day that um, Rodney King, uh, Brother King, and they had written on the chalkboard, there is a God, innocent, ha ha ha. He said he wanted to do the whole police station. He's the only black guy. So, yeah, there's, there's people that think this is a joke. And there's still, you know, you got to remember in LAPD, you got cops that ride around the Confederate flag stuck on the back of their cars. They got all these little organizations inside of there. You know, I don't know if y'all know about it, but there's some real ill shit going on in there, you know. And a lot of people join the police for the wrong reason. You know, they're the kids that got their ass kicked every day at school. And they grow up and they say, I'm and I know this is a fact because this kid needs to be his ass. I see him on Love Connection. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's, do, let's do five more. All right. Do you see any irony in the fact that the overwhelming majority of people that buy uh, the hardcore criminal rap records are, not criminal, but outlaw rap right. records are uh, young, white, suburban, middle class kids who may uh, see that as a way of uh, uh, challenging authority and in the same way are uh, keeping alive the stereotype of the digital and the gangster image of uh, black people? Now, I don't really feel to see a problem with that. Uh, the pigeonhole, man. Um, I believe that 80% of the rap music, especially the hardcore, is brought by white kids. Almost 50% of it is a 50 50 breakdown. The reason they buy it is because economically they can buy it. Take the white kid buys you tape, the CD, the tour jacket, he walks up to you with all the stuff, you know. The black kid brings you your tape, but it's a bit dumb. Because <laughs> can't it. So that's why. Monetarily, it's more white kids buying it. Now, as far as them, why they listen to it, it's kind of like a double rebellion. Rap started off as a double rebellion. The early rebellion was, Mama, I believe in the devil, okay? Because Mom would push this Christian thing on the white kids so they could go out and slay her, which would just piss Mom's off, you know? So, and it doesn't mean they believe in the devil, it's just a way of saying, <laughs> You know, people want to do something to make you mad. Because that's what that's major adolescent. It's just pissing parents off. They ain't cool. You got cool parents. They write it. Well, I got my Slayer t-shirt on, too. <laughs> <laughs> so after they went that way, the double rebellion was like, ah, I like rap. And then that made them even rebel against some of their white buddies. But it was really cool, because now you're totally different and you're in. And then with hardcore rap, they got stories and the life of the ghetto and, and how it was. And I think the fear is not of the music itself. It's the fear of that kid liking the rapper. I think it's more the fear of the white kid saying, I like EDD. And the mother said, no, 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 those black kids will take your money. And I, no, no, I, I, I like ice tea. And, and, and even worse than that, your little daughter taking the vanilla ice cold from over her little princess bedroom set and putting me. In the bedroom of the brother, they got an iced tea poster in there. So somebody on the art department knew that this was like the ultimate retaliation. It was iced tea poster. I wasn't sure. Okay, person now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because everybody we beat had it come to them. <laughs> it's like anytime you would beat a jewelry store for like a hundred thousand, they would say they got beat for two hundred thousand and beat the insurance companies. Anytime you rob somebody, they would turn around and flip it and stuff. It was always we would beat people who could take it. We never took anybody who couldn't handle it. And the people we kidnapped were drug dealers, and I don't like drug dealers. You know what I'm saying? So we should have killed them. <laughs> Um, as an artist, you obviously have some expressions that you want to get out of your life, but your feelings, your experiences as a human being, and 
Unfortunately, the recording process is an imperfect process. It takes what you have to say, some music, and puts it to it, and tries to convey it as best you can. What is it about the recording process, tracking, overdub, working with producers, pre-production, that you think takes away from what you have to tell the public? Is, it, is there something in the process that doesn't let you express yourself as well as you like to express yourself? Well, when you record, the problem is it's like you don't, you don't have one time to say it. And it's like when I speak live, I can change in midair when I'm thinking and talking, flow. That's why maybe a spoken word out is better. But when you're putting it into a song, a lot of times you have to put it into a lyrical format which makes it rhyme. Which, I mean, I met Neil Young, and Neil Young was like, yo, that is the best thing that ever happened. Because he said so many times he wanted to say things that he couldn't say. So now he's just talking. He said, it's cool, you know. But um, there's a lot of times, whenever you finish a record, you always walk away from it and say, man, I shouldn't have said that on it. I shouldn't have said that on it. But it's just a one-time thing. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I try to be as minutely inhibited as I possibly can when I'm in there. That's why you get this rare or crazy stuff. Like the end of OG album, he cursed out the president and everybody. And that was because we were mixing the album. And I just got on the phone with one of my boys who was in the J house, right? And they were sending the kids to Persian Gulf. And the TV was showing a picture of Bush's wife's foot. Right? And she sprained her ankle. And I was like, people are going to go die. What the fuck is the fuck about Bush's crippled bitch? <laughs> Fuck them, fuck that, fuck Butch, that is cool with that, you know? And people were like, well, what? No, but it was a, a very spontaneous thing. And that's when the music is really good on the edge of the same purple. Yeah, do you feel MTV has been good for uh, pop music or has it been good for the art, bad for the art, for the kids, commercially? Anything you have to say on MTV? MTV has the ability to make you a mega star. If they jump on you, you just be it's like MTV is the radio station for the world, nation especially. It's like, because when you're on MTV, you're on every TV. It's, it's like a, a national radio station, you know what I'm saying? You're on everybody's TV, so it's extremely powerful. Um, you got to be able, as an artist, to, to work without MTV, or you're going to work, you're going to, and always have to ask them what they want to play. They have a habit of holding you for a year and then discard you. That's why you see a lot of guitars come boom, blah, and then you deal this discard you. As far as it being good, it's good because it's bad because it's a monopoly. That's what makes it bad. It doesn't really have competition. Now they got video cue box, which is a good thing because people die playing and stuff. And you can see your own thing, but uh, they're very, they censor, they're very hypocritical over there. And I don't give a fuck about MTV. We make our records, I turn my video in, if they don't play them, cool. Because I get played on what they call mom and pa video shows, these little ones, enough. But a lot of, when you sign for a record label, a lot of them say, you gotta get an MTV record, and you could lose your mind. It's kind of like being a painter and going into a gallery and saying, what do you hang before you make your painting? That's not hard. Yeah, it's, it's really, Real bad. But it's a, it's a very fake genre that it is censored, it's not real, it's bullshit over there. But you could become a superstar if they like you. Uh, her. In light of your agenda and the fact that you want the right thing to happen, what kind of message do you think you're sending out to the young girls that are growing up in the ghetto? I don't really talk to the young girls. I have, I have, I have a, a, a song. And now on this album that's coming up, which is about teenage pregnancy, which is telling young girls that, you know. <laughs> you know. It's like they want the boots, you get the baby. It's like, you guys, it's like, it's more of a rap from the perspective of the guy. We also did a record about rape, which is uh, a record that they, I did, a, I did some new records. I did one called Sit Up, Come Sit Up Daddy's Lap for Body Count, which is about a father 
molested his daughter. Everybody's going to attack me because they don't really think that I'm the father that molested the daughter. In the song, I play the man that that's the part from his head, right? <laughs> so, but I got that record, so that's not that. I got a girl who's been tore up because her father who molested her. I got another song we're doing about rape where it's a bunch of guys and they're playing like it's cool, 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 cool. Yeah, yeah, and they're laughing. And then I come in and say, you know, I'm going to scar my life, you're an asshole, right? Then I got the other one I'm talking about, the girls saying, guys are trained programmed to go after this fun. And it's up to you to think about it because you're going to end up with the child, you know? But the problem with this is I don't really know what my fans really want to hear that. And when you, when you become an artist, you almost get you put in a little area where people want this from you or that from you. So a lot of stuff like that I got. I got a new little girl that's right out, who's 14 years old. And I might give her that material to do. You gotta know what you can do. If you don't want to give your love <laughs> No matter how much I love you, know, I just came to right there in the middle. In the 10th grade, she didn't want to have a baby. I wanted to have a baby. Uh, she gave me the baby in the hospital. I took care of the baby until it was three years old. With my gang and my friends, we had to leave and put blue rags on the baby. <laughs> <laughs> baby. But it was cool, and the baby was cool, and she like won't now. And stuff. I remember one time, they were, um, everybody was at my house, we had the baby, and they were getting ready to get high, and one of my buddies, now this dude is a crazy criminal, right? He's like, no, we can't have no, we can't have no party here without t-shirts in here, because there's a baby in here, and the police might come, somebody might flush the baby. <laughs> so, it was like, you know, with that, and that baby picture, they have the kid, three fathers, and we had a different form of that. <laughs> she had everything she needed, man, you know, we had to get her off. But that's why I went in the military, because I was in a situation where I was like, if I get busted out here doing my little slick stuff, I'm going to go to prison, I'm going to lose my kid. So I went in, and I went in a sole parent, right? And I did four years in there, and the last two months when I was in there, they found out that I was in the military, four years taking care of a baby by myself. I used to get babysitters and watch my little girl while I was going in the woods and come back from the field, and then they gave me what's called a sole parent discharge, because you can't get in the army like that. You know, but then after I came home, the mother, she was uh, stupid and all that. And mom has a family of seven people. And we, we made the arrangement, the babies got with the moms, and it's cool, and everything's cool. But, you know, I was one of them guys. I know about kids and everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, in regards to the LA riots, I know you uh, did a lot of work with Gravity, but you know, the riots in place. Do you envision like something like that ever happening again? And also, what would be the positives outweigh the negatives? You know, when the riots hit, Channel 11 ran up to my house, right, and got me, and they brought me to the station, right, and got something, right? Took me on television, put me on national TV, and said, tell them to stop. <laughs> <laughs> like, tell them to stop. <laughs> All I did, they showed me, they were showing the screen, and I'm watching the prompter, right? And I just spoke from here, you know? And I said, you know, this hurts me to see this happen. This is my neighborhood. But I hate to say, I told you so. And it's really, anybody who could have told them to stop could have prevented it. You see? So therefore, it's really nothing I can do because I can't honestly say that if I didn't have the money in my pocket, I wouldn't be right down there with it, you know? So, and once the anger and the rage and the night took off, and the poverty setting, and people are broke, and you see free stuff, and you see and you take it. You don't even look like you're taking it because you look at this big store as being the rich, and you're the poor. It's not like you're stealing. They don't go to the poor people and steal. They stole the, the, the good guys and the big things that they buy. Was, the system, they ripped off. Korean people took a hard hit because they were close to targets. It's like, you're here, and, and, and I got a song my new album called Race War, which says Korean people live down in the hood a little bit as fucking understood. Oreos were slow.
slaves too work with this fucking red, white, and blue. People from Iran and never did shit to us. It's wild with distrust. You know, and it breaks it down. It's like, let's figure out who we really should be mad at, you know. But um, I think the I think the right thing what happened it outweighed the bad. Because I hate to see what would happen if they had did that not guilty verdict and everybody had to sat back and say, It's cool. Because then the next one might have been violence. Real people might have got hurt. And my last answer, will it happen again? Yeah. The next time you get injustice on that scale, it's going to go down. It's not going to go down because those kids get found guilty because people know they're guilty. It's about straight up injustice. Yeah. And that was an injustice that was drawn out over a year. Everybody saw it. Everybody knew it. They were in jail. They got to stay good rid of them cops and they walk. That's what it takes. You know? But people don't want to ride. You know? But it went down. So hopefully we can prevent the next one. Cops start learning that they're people. I hope my record may have not really given you all this scared, you know, of a one-on-one ride, you know. Thank you. That's it.